So hi, Nathan, how are you doing? It's lovely to speak to you today. I am really good and it's lovely to talk to you as well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited. This is your first time at the at CMC, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it is. So I'm excited to check out everything and hear everyone's amazing stories and see all the exciting shows. It's been great. Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, uh, the point of this session today is really to go back to the beginning and learn a little bit more about your childhood, how you got your start in the industry. Um, and from having a brief discussion with you, I think today's discussion is going to be really interesting. Yeah. Um, so let's go right back to the start when you were really, really young. What's the first kind of bit of children children's media did you think, um, you know, that, that you watched that, that influenced you? Um, oh man, that is a really good question. Like I was saying, like, I love the Magic School Bus. That was a really uh -huh. big sort of show I loved. I love the uh, animation. It's like 2D, it's super colorful. You could travel through all the world, yet it's based in a school. So me and my everyday can, you know, hope that one day um, I can get on a Magic School Bus. But we never even had a school bus. So I don't even know why I connected like that. <laughs> um, and then I liked Bernard's Watch. I think that just the premise of that show, just all I just was fascinated with. The Queen's Nose, that was another really amazing one that I just absolutely loved. Um, and also I felt like that show was quite grown up for me because I was young, quite young watching it. And I just felt like, oh, look at me, like watching this show. And um, Round the Twist, is that Round the Twist? It is that. Yes, that's the Australian show set in a lighthouse. I would sing the theme tune, but I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you're you kind of make a good point. You, you're very, very multi-talented. Is singing not the fault? Is singing the maybe the, the one that you avoid? <laughs> singing is not for any... My singing is not for anybody's ears. I'll tell you that for free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's, you know, I, it's really interesting, actually. A lot of those shows involve time travel. And, you know, oh, yeah. kind of that concept. <laughs> and time as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. I didn't think of that. What, what's that say about me? Yeah, exactly. Were you, uh, you know, you, you're kind of maybe, you know, most well known for being, you know, an actor, but amongst that as well, being a writer. Were you, were you a big reader growing up or, you know, did, did kind no, of... No, no, to be honest, I wasn't because I'm dyslexic. So reading was okay. always just long. I just found it just... Uh, I find it difficult, so it wasn't something I like went towards a lot. But as I've got older, and I kind of get it that there's no rush, and I know the sort of books I like to read, yeah. I start to get back in it. But it was only literally becoming an author that made me go, I need to read more, and then I started to enjoy it. But as a kid, I was like, I just read uh, the Unfortunate Events series, and maybe uh -huh. the Odd Roll Dahl, but everything else was a bit like long. So, so you were much more of a fan of sort of the moving picture, movies, yeah, television. Yeah. That was kind of where you got your creative energy from. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So where did you where did you grow up? I grew up uh, in Shepherd's Bush, the greatest place okay. in the world, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, but it's a really big, it's always been a really big inspiration in my work. Because that. Uh -huh. that was a place where I just... I set everything, all my stories were from people I was meeting or uh, the, you know, the local chicken shop I could, I've got in my cartoon series. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I really took a lot of inspiration from where I live. So I love where I live. Yeah. So was it, um, when did you first sort of realise and, and feel that you wanted a, a kind of job or you wanted to work in the creative industry? Was there kind yeah. of like a light bulb moment or was it kind yeah. of sort of slow, slow sort of pass over time? Or, you know, would, would your parents have gone, ah, oh, you know, Nathan's going to end up in, you know, on the stage in the future? Uh, I mean, that's a good question. Like, I, my parents definitely wouldn't have thought that. I was just, I think I was quite quiet as a kid and now I'm a mm -hmm. big mouse. So, um, yeah, so I guess my... I mean, I wanted to be a PE teacher when I was growing up, oh. like when I was in school. But I'm crap at PE. I just wanted to be outside. So I was like, well, that's never going to work. Um, and then I did, uh, it was acting. I did my first play at the Lyric Hammersmith um, oh. as like a, like a youth theatre play. And I was just hooked. Like, you get to work with like a group of really exciting, crazy people for four weeks. You get to make a piece of work. Then you get to show it. And I just had that buzz. Um, 
And then I got a job at the theatre being an usher, just so I had to watch all of these plays like four or five times a night. Um, and I just got completely hooked with stories and seeing different plays and different ways of telling them. And I didn't know it was a job because, well, I didn't know it was a job, like a proper job, because nobody in my family did that at the time. So I just didn't quite get how these people were doing this. But I knew that I wanted to do something like that, really. Yeah. I think it's really interesting because uh, similarly, a lot of my love uh, of creativity and things like that comes from the theatre. Uh, yeah. you know, I think in the last year, obviously, the theatre has been decimated and I'm very excited to be going back and, and things. But it's so, I think, such an invaluable place that so many actors and creatives get their start at or you know, rather interestingly, I think as well, you know, find inspiration from when I'm having like yeah. a creative slump, I'm like, let's go to the theatre. <laughs> it's one of the most creative places full stop, isn't it? Because at the end yeah. of the day, they start with a black box, just an empty space, and you can build and do pretty, they like everything has been done in that space with really limited resources. So it's such a brilliant starting ground. And I think I'm as gonna... well, it it's so impactful that you can go and see like so many different um you can go see a show one night and see it another night and have a completely different experience yeah and that just because it's you know you watch a tv show and you can watch it back and again and it's always going to be the same but yeah. I, I think uh, you know a theater show just has that sort of love and attention Absolutely. When I was at Usher and it was that, it was like some nights a show, a joke would land really big and the audience were finding it hilarious. And some nights you'd just have people picking their nose in the audience. I'm just watching them. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So um, how did you feel, you know, kind of, you know, when you were younger, how big was, you know, representation and things like that? Were you seeing... Um, a good variety of people in, in the theatre and in the arts? Yeah, uh, like, definitely not, no. I, I think it's, no. The, I mean, from, when I think now, no. But I think, you know, when you're a kid, you don't watch TV like that. You just, it, it and it's dangerous, because kids mm -hmm. know when they see themselves, but generally yeah. you see yourself in everybody. So there's, that's the magic of young people and children is that, they see themselves in everyone, but it's our job as creators to uh, ensure that they see themselves so it doesn't have to be something that they don't think. So, you know, when I was going to the theatre or um, watching telly, no, there weren't that many young black kids. And I didn't have Sky or loads of those like American channels. So I wasn't seeing those sort of Nickelodeon shows like Keenan and Kel really. Um, so yeah, it was a shame when I look back now um, but I think that, you know, I do think like shows like Apple Tree House and stuff like that, there are real progress taking place. So, you know, that's what we can kind of ask for. Yeah. You know, I think I grew up sort of maybe maybe 10 years after you with with yeah. different shows and that. And I think it was still a big issue then. Um, yeah. But I think today, things, representation and the needle is slowly moving. You know, new, younger people coming into the industry like yourself is, yeah. you know, bringing a new kind of interesting perspective. Um, so I want to kick off because, you know, I think we had an interesting discussion before about the power of cold emails. Yeah. Um, so, so after leaving secondary school, did you have an enjoyable time in secondary school? Um, I had... Uh, would, would I go back? No. <laughs> People always go, oh, wouldn't you love to go back to secondary school now with what you know? I'm like, hell no, no. My life now was great. I have a great life. But then it's just like, oh, it's just, it's not, I, I could have had a miserable time, but it was just, it was not my thing. I don't learn well in that environment. Yeah. It's just not, yeah, it's not for, it wasn't for me. I'll put it like that. Yeah. So, you know, you sent a cold email after leaving secondary school. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so basically I left secondary school. I didn't get great GCSEs or A. Well, I got bad A levels. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I got a place at university, but I didn't go. I got a play. I was doing a I was in a youth theatre and I told my parents instead of going to the uni, I was gonna do this youth play and my dad was like how much are they paying you and I was like nothing and he was like great this sounds so positive um and then 
I, me and my best friend, well, best friend, we, we're just hustlers. And I think we, we used to be in a comedy group and we'd make sketches on our phones. Like, we do not phones, but like, like old flip cameras, whatever. Wow, I'm really like old. Anyway, um, we made a few sketches and we were just sending them around to different people. And by this point, I'd started to develop my own cartoon series. And I knew I wanted to talk to the guy who made Rasta Mouse because that, sh that show was so just amazing and brilliant and funny and was just like the tone, but I'd never written anything. And on top of that, I'd never written anything of worth of a TV producer, you know, like, it was like a big deal for me. Um, so on this day, me and my best friend, we decided that we were gonna guess um, the TV producer's email and he was gonna guess a movie producer's email on the same day. And his movie producer runs, he ran Warner Brothers at the time. So he was like a big, 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 big deal. And um, I emailed Greg Boardman, who is an amazing TV producer. And on the, so I emailed Greg, I was like, hi, I'm this guy, I've got this idea, I love Rasta Mouse. Can I come and talk to you about my cartoon series? And basically five minutes later, Greg emailed back being like, yeah, come in, come down to my office. And I went down with like a, 50 page Bible of all these little ideas I'd had about this show and drawings I'd got an illustrator Dapo to kind of do who now illustrates look up our book together so that relationship kept going and yeah Greg basically from that cold email bought my the rights to my tv show commissioned me to write Rasta Mouse and then basically gave me a career writing tv that was my start it was like before that, I'd never written a professional TV script. And that cold email got me that. And my friend also, um, when he emailed the head of Warner Brothers, the head of Warner Brothers emailed back and was like, no one ever sends me emails like this. So yeah, and he invited my friend down to the studio and you know, offered to mentor him. So the point is, long story short, send those cold emails. They work yeah. sometimes. There's a lot of rejection. <laughs> But it's always it's always for that one email that works and that one email that sticks that could be worth yeah. you know spending the days one email that, sending them. Yeah, honestly, one email that does work and sticks. It's amazing. I've had a few. I've had a few. Honestly, cold emails like Greg was an amazing one. I think John Plowman at the BBC was another one. Like it was, and also I guess at the end of the day, people just want to hear from people and good ideas, and that that is the winner. You know. Yeah. No, I think that's really really impactful. Um, so after, so you got thrown essentially into the children's media sphere, um, yeah. had you, you know, before sending that email, had you known you wanted to go down the children's route? I mean, I mean, I feel like now you've done so much wider outside of children's as well, yeah. but, uh, you have done a significant amount of work, you yeah, know, writing yeah. books and writing scripts in, in this industry. Was it something that you were, were set on or was it just something, you know, that was kind of a happy mistake? Uh, I think just a happy mistake. Cause again, like I didn't know people got, I know this sounds dumb, but I didn't, I was never thinking I'm gonna get paid to write cartoons. Cause if you say that to someone, you say that to other grown ups <laughs> in this world, they're like, real people don't do that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Well, so for me, it was a beautiful, happy mistake because, and also because I was dyslexic and I really struggled to write cohesive sentences anyway, I was never thinking this was gonna be for me. It just so happened. I was really lucky to stumble into someone like Greg who could say, okay, I'll take you through how we do this. And was really patient and kind. And then working with the incredible team at CBeebies, like Vanessa Amberley and her team, again, they were literally like, we will take you through this step by step by step, you know? And so it was kind of almost like a film school of writing, but we were just doing it in the medium. So, writing sketches for giggle beers and then they're going to get made it it was brilliant it is brilliant i think it's, it's such an interesting way to learn because you're doing yeah. it kind of as you're doing it i think maybe yeah. the most comparable thing is is like you know lots of companies television production companies offer apprenticeships and yeah. you know that get people that are young in there um but 
it's you know I think super super interesting to hear. No, and I think and just on that, did that. Point, and just on that point, you were just saying like another thing I really appreciated at that time in my career was that CBBS and well, basically CBBS was keeping me paid. Like you know what it's like as a young creative. Like money is like where do like everything's like a scheme or something like that mm -hmm. and what CBBS was doing was giving me experience but also putting money in my pocket that meant I could invest it back into my art making short films and so on so like really it was like a huge stepping stone for me not yeah. stepping stone yeah like I said it was amazing yeah. yeah so what um what made you shift from you know writing you know for CBBS and some other shows to um, choosing to write a children's book? Um, again, that was another really happy mistake where um, <laughs> I pitched the story for my kids book to an animation company in London and they rejected it. And then um, my agent was like, "Well, you should write this as a picture book." And I was like, "Well, I don't write books." So I don't know why you're telling me this. And then as all freelancers can probably uh, believe that I got a really big tax bill through and I didn't have that money. So I was like, boy, I better learn how to write kids books quick so I can pay this <laughs> tax bill. So I went to Waterstones and I bought, with the last of my money's bought about 20 picture books and I just studied them, I read them. And I thought, how can I make this, um, story I've got into a picture book. So really it was, again, a happy mistake, but generally with everything in my career, like once I fall in it, so writing kids TV, it's such a joy. I never want to leave. Writing kids books, now I've fallen into it. I never want to leave and I become a geek and I kind of just study it all. And now I'm writing other kids books. So generally with me, it's just about having, um, being, I've learned to be more open to trying everything and then seeing what I like and don't like and I've been quite lucky there yeah no, it's awesome and I mean um you know for being a debut author you did mm. the book did pretty well by the sounds of it um yeah, and, it's you know what you <laughs> being all right yeah, yeah. I'm being <laughs> all right yeah me and Daffo um were very lucky and uh really happy like the team at Penguin again same with CBB I've been really lucky with everybody I've worked with in the industry mm -hmm. has been extremely patient and caring so yeah. when I walked into Penguin like again I studied books for like a week from Waterstones I didn't know nothing so they again helped me craft the story so uh, yeah like in that aspect I mean collaboration has helped me a lot um, yeah well I think I, I think it's it's really valuable because I don't know if your experience has been the same but I would say out of kind of all the different areas of children of media in general children's mm. media is one maybe one of the most mm. welcoming and nice and willing to help mm. more than you know say maybe if you're doing high-end television and things like that the I think the kind of opportunity and the kind of support that children's media gets, yeah. you know, is, is so invaluable. No, um, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Absolutely. Every single person I've worked with in children's telly has just been like yeah. incredible. Yeah. So, you know, to, to, to let the audience know, um, and just from reading, uh, you know, what I read online, uh, you know, your, your book found its way to the Sunday Times bestseller list. <laughs> <laughs> one, it it won the overall Waterstones Children's Book Prize in 2020, um, and you know I think what always cements a success for a book is that you you know you 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 wrote a follow up, which I think yeah, is always yeah. the, the big thing <laughs> that, yeah, that yeah. always goes well. Obviously, obviously Penguin must have liked the book if if it come, came so they wanted Penguin another one. Very good. <laughs> uh, so you very know. Um, you're you're doing lots and lots of exciting stuff i think you know with with your sky tv show you know amongst other things um, i think you've got a stage show coming up haven't you as well or, or have uh, you just come I, off I, the I back of that <laughs> uh, but you know you're you're kind of doing things in all mediums uh yeah. you know kind of what what's next in in the children's media world have you got plans and ambitions of taking taking yeah. it on further um Absolutely. Are you hoping, yeah I've, at the moment, I'm 
with the amazing Illuminated and we're developing the Rocket TV show, which oh, awesome. I am so excited about. Like, <laughs> I think it, I've seen a bit of like a moving animation of Jamal and Rocket and their cat. And it's just like, I, I want to see that piece come alive. So mm-hmm. I hope that happens. Um, so we're working on that. And then I'm developing um, my cartoon about an Afro superhero, which is going to be great and writing more books um mm-hmm. and i've got a movie coming out but that's not children's movie it's a rom-com but um that's coming out as well <laughs> so you're keeping very very busy uh, keeping very very busy keeping <laughs> out of trouble yeah yeah fantastic well um it's been great chatting you, to you today nathan uh if you've got one final piece of advice for say young people or new people to the industry uh yeah. what would that be um, it would be be audacious. So that means like, like your dreams are never big enough. Always think of what the biggest dream is. Who's the most? So if you've got an idea that you think that Will Smith has to read, try and find a way that Will Smith's got to read it. Like, don't mm-hmm. allow other people in your life to put your uh, limits of who you are and who you are creatively in a box. So just think as stupidly big as possible and try and get all the way there and have a great time and be nice. <laughs> I think being nice is maybe one of the most valuable things that people in this industry, if, you, if, you're, not, if you're not nice to people, you're, you get a bad reputation very, very Quick. quickly. Be nice, be nice, be nice. Well, so thank you, Nathan. This has been yeah. lovely. Yeah, it's been lovely to chat to you. Um, and yeah, and hopefully uh, we'll see you around CMC. Yes, definitely. Have a lovely day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.